Good morning, Anthem Chapel. Uh, my name is Rhett Awesome. I'm the high school pastor here. And just like this message said, uh, today we're going to be opening up God's Word, uh, looking at the changing power that the gospel of Jesus Christ can have in our lives. So if you can open up with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Started a new series through the book of 1 Corinthians two weeks ago with Pastor Nate, who is out of town with his wife in Florida. He's big time. He's out teaching out of church out there, so, uh, you know, might not see much of him anymore. Kidding? Love you, Nate. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, the first week, two weeks ago, we saw Paul just give an introduction, say, hey, I am Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ uh, to the church in Corinth, and then after that, he kind of says, hey, and I thank you the church, or I thank God for the church in Corinth for all that he's doing in you. Uh, and then he kind of dives right into this first point of the Corinthians church being divided over leaders. It says some were saying, I am of Paul, some I am of Apostle, Apollo, some I, have, uh, I am of Christ. And Paul really jumps right into this idea of division in the church. And before I get into today's passage, I kind of want to hearken back to what Nate said because it sets up ours well, uh, that in the Corinthian church, there were a lot of problems. We're going to see that uh, in the next coming couple of months. Uh, this church had a lot of problems, and yet the first thing that Paul chooses to address, and the first thing that the Holy Spirit chooses to address through Paul, is this topic of unity in the church. And this is a topic that, honestly, I think gets overlooked many times in our modern day, uh, because it's so precious to the heart of Jesus. I'm actually going to turn to the book of John, chapter 17. And in this passage, this is right before Jesus goes to the cross, and he's in the garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying uh, for his disciples, and he's, then he's praying for us. What it says in 17, verse 20, it says, My prayer is not for them alone, the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they, also, uh, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that the world may be brought to comp- uh, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved me, even as you have loved me. And so this idea, uh, Jesus is saying, hey, the way that the world knows that God has loved and sent Jesus is the unity in the church. And that's a big statement. That's a big responsibility on our part. Jesus is saying, hey, the way you treat one another is going to either prove or disprove in their eyes whether or not I am true. And this is the way Paul uh, is introducing this letter. And he's not saying, hey, preaching is not useful because we have the Great Commission. Uh, but what he's saying is that the way that you preach is not going to save people, uh, but rather the way that you live is going to save people. And then he goes into this verse in verse 17, if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 17. It says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And Paul introduces this idea uh, that I would never think of on my own, that the cross of Christ can somehow be emptied of its power. That the cross of Christ, as the new King James says, uh, can be made of no effect. And in my mind, you know, I first go to Isaiah chapter 55 that says, you know, that when the word of God goes forth, uh, it will not return void, but rather will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent out. And yet Paul is making this statement, uh, hey, the cross of Christ can be made emptied of its power uh, if it's relied upon and taught on and trusting in the wisdom of the world and the methods of the world. That's what he says, verse 17. Not with wisdom and eloquence, referring to worldly wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And so we look at that and we're like, why would he say that? And now we have in our passage today the exclamation to that. We have the fact, hey, this is why this is the case. And today we're going to be looking at verse 18 through 25, a short little section. Um, but this section is powerful. And this section is uh, something that I would say no human being would ever come up with if they're trying to justify and defend the gospel. Uh, but this is the reason why 
we cannot rely upon worldly wisdom. We cannot rely upon worldly methods uh, to have the cross of Christ reach the world. And I'm actually going to do something different. Uh, we're going to read the entire passage through two times, okay? Because this is a really cool passage I want to soak in. And the first time, I want you guys to be reading along with me. Hopefully, it's up on the screen. Uh, and then the second time through, I just want us, you guys, to close your eyes. And I'm going to read it again. Uh, and as I read it, just be praying, Lord, speak to me what you have to say to me through this passage. Uh, this is a passage that has the power to change the way we live our life and change our outlook on life. And so I want it to sink in. So let's dive in. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. I'm going to be going through verse 25. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to, to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for knowledge, wisdom, sorry, Sorry, you guys were right. You guys are right. Uh, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Now let's go through that one more time, and I encourage you, hey, close your eyes right now. Uh, really take this opportunity, and maybe this is something you're not used to doing, uh, but right now, as your eyes are closed, uh, pray and ask the Lord, Lord, speak to me what this passage is saying. Lord, reveal to me what you have for me in this passage. I'm going to read it again. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks seek for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Lord, this is your word, and it is the truth, Jesus. And as we open up your word today, Lord, I pray that um, my words would be forgotten, Lord, and your words would be remembered, Jesus. We don't desire to learn any human wisdom this morning. We don't desire to learn some tactic to preach your gospel. Lord, we desire to know the foolishness of the gospel of Christ to salvation, Jesus. And it's not what we think, uh, it's not our plan, it's not our strategy, Lord, it is the power and the strategy of heaven uh, that saves lost souls and who saved us. Lord, open up our eyes this morning. We love you, pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read again, verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, uh, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. To a world who has rejected the mercy of God, the gift of God, the grace of God, the message that some guy 2,000 years ago that died on a cross has the power to save them is foolish. That's what it says. Hey, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And I think the wrong response, an improper response uh, to understanding and believing the gospel is, you know, uh, people who don't believe the gospel, they don't believe it because they're an idiot. You know, that is not the case. That is not what we should think. Uh, act, in fact, Paul argues the opposite later on in chapter 2 in 1 Corinthians. 
I think it's verse 14. It says, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. A physical world, apart from God, cannot understand the message of God. It's something that has to be revealed through His Spirit. And we don't look to a world then and say, hey, these guys are just dumb. They don't understand what God has done. We have to understand it's something that has to be revealed to them through the Spirit. But I do want us to think for a second, as Christians, the message we believe can seem a little foolish in the eyes of the world. It starts off strong by saying God's Spirit comes and gets a teenage girl pregnant with God, who is actually himself, because he's three people in one. A little weird, starting off. But this baby, he's born, and this baby's God, uh, and he works in his dad's cabinet shop for 30 years. His dad was a carpenter, if you didn't get that joke. Uh, but he was a carpenter for 30 years. He just, like, you know, did, made stuff out of wood, whittle a knife, whatever he's doing. God's doing that for 30 years. Uh, and then after that, his homeless cousin baptizes him. And so then he just goes out and starts telling people about the kingdom of heaven, and introducing them these ideas that they've never heard or even thought of before. And then he makes people so mad that eventually they kill him. But guess what? Guess what happened? He came back to life, right? And because he did that, now I get to go to heaven. That sounds foolish in the eyes of the world. That is not a story that I would come up with if I'm trying to create a great pitch for why you should join my club, right? It's something that has to be spiritually revealed as the truth to us. And as foolish as that message might seem in the eyes of the world, it is true. It is true. And I believe that with all my heart. Everything I just said, I believe is the truth. That Jesus did come and made himself of no reputation. And came to earth as a human being and lived a life just like I live a life. And yet did it perfectly. And because he lived a life like I lived and died a death like I'm destined to die, he has now made a way for me to have a relationship with him and to come to him in relationship and in eternity. And that's the spiritual component uh, to the story of the gospel that is not understood with a human, worldly perspective and mindset. Right? That's the spiritual reality behind the real story of what Jesus came to do. And that has to be revealed through the Spirit. It's not something that we can understand. And this is the gospel, and I believe it because look in verse 18. It is the power of God. And notice it does not say that it reveals the power of God, or it shows us, or points to the power of God. It says the message of the cross is the power of God. And the message of the cross is the power of God in my life and in your life, and it can be the power of God in anyone's life, uh, to save and redeem and restore. And this is the message that we preach. And look in verse 19. It says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And I think all of us, as we look out at the world around us, uh, all of us can see and agree that when the world pursues their own wisdom, when the world pursues their own desires, uh, it is foolishness. Right? Look at our society. We say right is wrong and wrong is right. We say purity is just intolerance. We say a man can be a woman if he wants. He can also be a man, depending on the day. Or a woman can just be whatever she wants, man or woman, depending on the day. We say coveting is not a sin. That's the blessing of capitalism, right? I can just want whatever I want. And this is the foolishness of the world that we now call wisdom. And in humanity's attempt to free itself of the wisdom of God, uh, we have bought into lies, foolish lies. Just think about what you know, we teach as a, and accept as a general society that monkeys just had babies long enough and enough times that they just started looking like people. And they just started acting like people too. And you know, actually, I was looking this up. Um, does anyone know what they believe came, monkeys came from? No? Squirrels. It was a squirrel-like creature. I looked up, I was like, what do they think? And now you understand why they try to make it appealing. When they say, you know, humans came from monkeys, you're like, okay, they kind of look like us. But when you say people came from squirrels, you're like, that's stupid. 
<laughs> you know, who's going to believe that? And yet this is the wisdom of the world uh, that in, truly, in reality, is foolishness. And it's true, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And you look around in the world and it says, where's the wise person? Where's the scribe? Where's the teacher of the law? And you look around and, and you can't find truth in our society today uh, because they're relying upon a worldly wisdom that is not revealed by the Spirit of God. Look in verse 21. It says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Now, grammatically, it's a little hard to understand sometimes. When I don't understand it, I try to go to another translation. And actually, I really like, if you know what the Message Bible is, it's not like a full-blown, you know, whatever scripture. Um, so don't try not to argue with me. But it gets this point across pretty well. It says in the Message Bible, since the world in all of its fancy wisdom never had a clue when it came to knowing God, God in his wisdom took delight in using what the world considered stupid, preaching of all things, to bring those who trust him into the way of salvation. And it's true, the world and all of its intelligence and all of its thoughtfulness and all of its wisdom, it does not have a clue when it comes to relationship with God. It does not have a clue when it comes to life with God. And cannot understand uh, why Christians would live a certain way. It cannot understand why God would say certain things in this word. Let me just give you a couple of examples. For example, praying before eating. If you're out in public, someone looks at you praying before you're eating, and they think they're just crazy, right? What are they doing? And I remember in high school, this guy said, you know, you invite your Christian friend over, and your mom's worked on dinner for three or four hours, and then your Christian friend comes and thanks God for it. And it's like, what about my mom? You know, and this is the wisdom of the world, right? And it does not understand that even the things we work for, even the things that we attain in life, man, it's a blessing from God. It's not something we gain on our own strength. Everything we have, everything that's given to us and everything we've earned is a blessing from God. You cannot say, I've earned this, I've done this apart from God. Everything, God's word says in his word, rain comes on the just and on the unjust, meaning he blesses the just people and the unjust people, apart from merit. Everything we earn, everything we receive is purely a gift from God, and the world can't understand that. And so if they don't understand that, they're definitely not going to understand tithing, right? Why would you just throw money away to Lars, you know, or to Nate? I'm kidding. Lars, where's Lars? I think he's back there. Oh, there he is for you. Um, Lars actually is the only one that makes us not waste money. Yeah, <laughs> Anthem. Um, why would you throw money away like that? You're just going to give money just, just for fun because God said so? You know, they don't understand that tithing is not like a fundraiser of God's. Uh, tithing is God's way of releasing our heart from the love of money, right? They don't understand why you wouldn't go golfing on a Sunday morning. They don't understand why you would skip the game for Sunday morning church. I might offend some people here. The world doesn't understand why you would skip your kid's soccer game for church, right? It's foolishness to them. And they think you hate your kid if you do that. I do think it was funny, like, if you send a kid to college and they study for 14 hours a day and drink like six coffees an hour and haven't slept in four days, you look and you're like, that is commitment. That's hard work. And then some parent skips their four-year-old's AYSO game and they're like, they're a religious zealot and they hate their kids. You know, it just doesn't make sense. It's the foolishness of the world, right? And I might upset some more people here. Uh, let me get through this before you start throwing stuff, okay? If voting our person into office is more important than praying for our nation, we could be relying upon worldly wisdom. Because what our nation needs is not a man in an office. What our nation needs is Jesus on the throne. And voting doesn't bring Jesus on the throne. Prayer brings Jesus on the throne. What is First, Second Corinthians 10, 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, earthly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And if we want to see strongholds in our nation removed and broken down, the way to do it is not legislation, uh, but it is prayer. It's getting on our knees. The weapon, these weapons are powerful for bringing down strongholds. And the world looks at this stuff and it says foolishness. What's skipping a soccer game? Uh, you know, what's talking to the air going to do to change anything? But we recognize 
uh, that on a Sunday morning, God speaks. And I believe, as a parent, my daughter back there, God wants to speak to my daughter this morning. And so I'm going to prioritize bringing her to church because I believe that God has something to say to her. And I'm not going to miss that opportunity in her life for something that I think is important. Not saying if you skip church, you're a bad parent. Not saying that. But I'm saying, hey, do we need to refocus? Do we need to realign? And they say, what does praying do? And before, you know, someone assaults me on the patio, I'm not saying don't vote. Okay, don't. I'm not saying don't vote. What I'm saying is that table out there for voter registration uh, is not a picketing line for us to enact the social change we want. Uh, it is a place of prayer to respond to the heart and will of God for our nation. And this is the wisdom of God that is foolishness in the eyes of the world. The world cannot understand it. Sometimes I don't understand it, right? I need to constantly be refocused, resharpened, realigned, re set on my destiny in my eternity with Jesus. Let's look at verse 22. We're going to keep going. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. I'll say it again. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And to the Gentiles, an unsaved, unreligious, worldly mindset, the message of the cross is foolishness. And to the Jew, the super-religious, the hyper-religious, the hyper-ritualistic, the message of the cross is a stumbling block. And to understand that, we have to understand the daily life of a Jewish person when this was written. A Jewish person, their whole life, they never touched pork. They never worked on the Sabbath. They lived by strict dietary laws. They, um, they uh, what am I trying to say? I wrote it down. Observed. Observed rituals and festivals and all these things. They paid a temple tax, and they did this because, hey, they believed this was getting them to God. This was making God pleased with them. This was gaining God's favor. Uh, and then the Jewish, the religious person hears some random Gentile in Corinth, who's not even a part of their religious organization, saying that, yeah, the Jewish God is true, uh, but all you have to do to be saved is just believe in Jesus. And that is a stumbling block to the religious person. They say, look at all the stuff I've done. Look at all this good thing. Look at all the, look at my church attendance. Look, I've served in the nursery. Lord, help them. I have helped on the worship team. And look at all this stuff I've done, and you're saying that I'm in the same position as some guy who's never even been to church? The message of the cross, the grace of the cross, is a stumbling block to the religious person because we all have that desire to measure up to God, to prove ourselves to God. To the Jews, a stumbling block. To the Greeks, foolishness. But we preach Christ crucified. And the message does not change uh, depending on who we're talking to, whether you are religious or unreligious, American or not American, old or young, rich or poor, educated and uneducated. We preach Christ crucified. And the Christ, as 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, let me just turn there actually, says, now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken to stand. For what I received, I passed on to you as a force First importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters. The message of the cross, the gospel, is that Jesus Christ died according to the scriptures, that Jesus Christ was buried, and Jesus Christ rose again according to the scriptures, and then that Jesus Christ appeared again. Right, that's important. It's not just Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose. It's important that he appeared again. He came back for us. He revealed himself to us. And the message does not and cannot change depending on who we're talking to. Because this message is the power of God. And this actually gives me a lot of peace. Because I don't have to go out uh, and think, oh, this person's way smarter than I am. I have to like try to get this message together and make it sound really smart. Or this person doesn't really understand, so I have to change this message to, no. We preach Christ crucified to the Jew, to the Greek, to the person who thinks it's foolishness, to the person who's going to be offended by it. This is what we preach. We preach Christ crucified as a church. 
And there's an old uh, pastor's story. I kind of doubt it's true, but it gets the point across. Of a church, and they built this new building, and they put this motto above like an arch in their church. We preach Christ crucified outside. Maybe you've heard this story before. And they planned to like gardens around it. And somewhere down the line, uh, they were just like, you know, the crucifixion part, the, like dying to yourself, it's kind of hardcore. People don't really want that. We're just going to stop preaching that. And it says the vines kind of grew over the crucified. So now it just said, we preach Christ. And then after a while, they're like, you know, Christ, he's old. He's 2,000 years old, in fact. Uh, this is outdated. We can't teach this stuff anymore. And the vines kept growing up, and it just says, we preach. And then they're like, you know, people actually don't really want to just sit there and listen to someone. Uh, so we're just kind of going to do away with that, have someone juggle or something, you know, entertain them. Uh, and the vines grew up, and it just said, we, right? And that's all church is, apart from Christ, apart from the crucifixion, apart from God's word. It's a social club, right? We, we. Why are you here? Uh, we, you know. If you remove these important aspects from church, it ceases to be the church. We preach Christ crucified. Every aspect important uh, and every aspect essential. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Right? And this is why it gives us peace. Pe- gives me peace. Uh, it's the power of God unto salvation. I don't have to be ashamed of it. I don't have to shy back from it because it is God's power revealed. Verse 25, we're closing out here. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. A misconception we can fall into is thinking that God's wisdom is just man's wisdom multiplied to the highest degree, right? God is like, if we're here, God's up here. Uh, But that is not the case. What Isaiah says in chapter 55 It says, as my ways or my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as my thoughts or as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts and your ways higher than my, my ways higher than your ways. Sorry, I should have written it down. My bad. Uh, But what it's saying, he's like, hey, my thoughts are not your thoughts. It's not like you can just like get on track and like, okay, I'm going to think like God. God's way of thinking is higher than our ways. God's way of thinking is different from our ways. We have to completely surrender to his will to understand his wisdom. And this verse is saying, not saying that God is either weak or strong or weak or foolish. That's not what it's saying, right? The foolishness of God. It's not saying he's foolish. Uh, because you look at this and is it foolishness that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God uh, and that he took on human flesh and dwelt among us. That the wisdom of God is that God took on human flesh and subjected himself to his own creation to save his own creation? Is it the strength of God to be beat and spit upon and nailed to a cross? And this is what the world looks at it as. It looks as the weakness of God. And yet, when the world says, you know, what kind of weak God can be killed on a cross? I would say point them to Isaiah 25a. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people, he will be taken away from the earth, for the Lord has spoken. When they say, what kind of God would subject himself to his creation and die? You point them to 2 Timothy 1.10. But has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. When the world says, what kind of God can like empty of his power and, or whatever and become a human being, that's not possible. Uh, you point them to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When the imperishable has been clothed with the, or the perishable clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? But the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to our God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And when the world says, what kind of foolish God uh, would come and live as a human being, as one of his creation, uh, you point them to Hebrews chapter 4, 15, that we're not without a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, uh, but rather one that was tested in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. And when the world says, what foolish God would think dying for people would help, you point them to 2 Corinthians 5, for our sake he made him 
to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This last one, I think when the foolish world says, what kind of God can't justify and save his own people? I'll point them to Romans chapter three. It says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. And listen to this part. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And what the world points to the weakness of God. Hey, look at all this weakness of God. When the world points to the foolishness of God, look at what, why would God do this? It does not truly reveal his weakness or his foolishness, but in reality reveals how strong of a God we really have. That the cross of Christ does not demonstrate the weakness of God, but rather the cross of Christ shows the strength of God that is most powerful to redeem and to save. And as we close, worship team, you can come on up. Um, I want to challenge you, are you relying upon worldly wisdom? Are you living according to your own wisdom and trying to add Jesus to it? Are you trying to live the Christian life according to human wisdom? Because if you are, you are emptying the power of the cross in your life. And if you're a person who says, I want to experience the power of Christ in my life. I want to experience the presence of God in my life. I want to experience the wisdom of God in my life. And you don't feel that. I would say there is maybe an aspect in your life where you're relying upon worldly wisdom. That's what it says in verse 17. The cross of Christ is emptied of its power in our lives. When we rely upon human wisdom, when we rely upon human technique. And oftentimes I think we can agree with the message of the cross over our life of grace and salvation. Man, he saved me. Uh, But I do not agree with the methods of the cross in my life. That I'm called to die. I'm called to lay aside my rights. I'm called to become of no reputation like him, like John said in John chapter 3. It says, I must decrease that he must increase. And this is the method of the cross in my life, that I become like Jesus was. And so as we enter into a time of worship, I'd encourage you, hey, do a heart check, right? Do a mind check. Where are those areas of your life that you're relying upon human wisdom? Where there's areas in my life where maybe I look at God's message and I do think it's foolishness. Sometimes I do, I'm like, God, you know, I'm embarrassed. You know, I don't want to say this to these random strangers. They might think I'm weird, you know. It's foolishness in the world's eyes. But I know from God's word, I am promised, that it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, not certain people, for all. And so, Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your cross, Jesus that your cross fills my life with power. It fills my life with purpose. It fills my life with wisdom, Jesus. Apart from the cross, Lord, my world, Lord, it's upside down. Lord, I don't see clearly without your cross. Lord, your cross points and says, you're a sinner, you need a savior. Your cross points and says, there's a God who loves you. Your cross points and says, there is a gift for your salvation of the spirit. Lord, if I do not understand the cross, Lord, I miss the blessing of the cross. Jesus, help me not to rely upon my own wisdom. Lord, in those moments where I think I am strong, Lord, just reveal to me how foolish I am. Lord, how foolish you've made the wisdom of the world. Lord, and that sometimes you call us to things in life that we don't understand, God. And Lord, when you call us to those moments when you open, when we open up your word and read those texts where I don't understand and say, how could this be? Lord, give us faith to believe it. Give us faith to say, I believe that because God wrote this, it is true, no matter how foolish it might seem in my family, no matter how foolish it might seem in my business, no matter how foolish it might seem in my relationships, God's word says it, and because God's word said it, this is the power of God for my life. This is the calling of God over my life. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you for your love. Open our eyes to what you have for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to Anthem Chapel. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and podcast for more content like this.